Greetings programs. This is an episode originally recorded way back in early November 2016. It was the second part of two sessions uh, following up our original attempt to record our conversation about a crow that happened in early September that kind of quickly went off the rails and stayed there. Uh, that conversation I'll include in the next couple of weeks. It's kind of a B-side. Once again, I want to thank Jimmy and John for spending almost uh, two afternoons over here at the studios. But yeah, this is our first, I guess to say it's the first of two episodes talking about the comic and film spectacle that is The Crow. Hi, I'm Jeremy. I'm a dork living in Portland, Oregon who spent too many years listening to podcasts and not doing anything creative. This is my attempt to rectify that, to create and contribute something where I talk to people about their cultural obsessions and try to give some recommendations of my own. Welcome to Giving the Mic to the Wrong Person. It didn't need, it didn't, I don't even remember what the rest the, the, of the it, the was, lo, it was the Lollapalooza episode, and uh, it ended up with a, a Sonic Youth stealing uh, Peter Frampton's sandwiches out of his cooler. Oh, yeah. And then, uh, mm-hmm. then they accidentally set his floating pig, or they set, uh, uh, he was, he had uh, the floating pig from Pink Floyd on loan, and it got loose. Right, I remember. And so Frampton had like a meltdown on stage and began crying like a little girl. How? <laughs> it was just like Frampton. And, and then, uh. <laughs> How, how we need a so symbol that cute. says we're gay and Republican. <laughs> oh no, that was that was the pink elephant. That was the pink elephant. That was that was, that was a different episode. Right? Yeah. Okay, never mind. Although it would have it would have actually worked in that the episode pink, too. Yeah. Really, I think. Uh, yeah. Anyway, are we going to start recording? <laughs> we should probably get started if you're going to be done by four ish. <laughs> And we're back. Welcome back to yet another episode of Giving the Mic to the Wrong Person. Uh, our second part, yeah, our, say our second, <laughs> our second part, or inadvertent second, second half of talking of attempting to t- ostensibly talking about the crow uh, with my two guests here. If you, if you two would please introduce yourselves yet again. Hi, my name is Jonathan Asher, uh, and this is Jamia Jefferson. I've been calling you Jemiah all this time. I'm so sorry. That's okay. Almost everyone does it to the point where I only partially notice and even more rarely actually step in to correct. I just respond to both of those things at this point. But that's one of the reasons why when I meet people socially, I often tell them, just call me Jem. Good story. Simplicity itself. <laughs> it's okay, John. I forgive you everything. I forgive you everything. Did you ever, did you immediate tangent? Did you ever see the um, <laughs> the YouTube series that that uh, that a um, what are some, I guess a, a drag performer and I think in San Francisco did who goes under the post under the name Sienna Danima called uh, Jizz in the Mammograms. Put your penis yeah. away, Jizz. <laughs> Have you ever seen Jizz in the ma- Jizz in the Mammograms? No. Oh, it's great. It's very much they they it's like a so guy wrong. redubs just compl- you creatively redubs only this time Jizz is a uh, kind of kills off the original gem and takes over as this kind of Jizz Jizz on your belly. Ooh, Jizz. My Jizz is real smelly. Ooh, glamour and glitter. Drag queens insane. Jizz, my jizz is contagious. Truly, truly fucking contagious. Human monster, drug pushing, like um, dangerous, amoral whore. Yeah, just not just that. Runs, runs, runs an orphanage for young girls. This sounds brilliant. Where, and where like her entire point is just so it's forcing wrong. them all to get an abortions. And um, yeah. why aren't we talking about this instead of the crow? <laughs> Well, <laughs> Jeremy, because because we have to because I have to I have to finish up this. I want to finish up this episode. Yeah. Else. No. Uh, we watch there Jizz we and the mammograms, and then come back, and maybe we'll do a podcast about it. Because really, we we we've we've got to we've got to talk about that phenomenon. Yeah. And it's and it's very weird to see uh, see the guy show up on you know out of at some point well like you know show up out of, uh, on like YouTube interview shows, just t- talking like, switching to the voice and it's as um, I get, it's, it's like seeing Dan Castanella Castanella <laughs> Castan, whatever yeah, yeah switch switch voices and um, mm-hmm. yeah or Frank Oz 
or Fra- yeah, Frank has deeply been. surreal shit. When yeah, you just like all of it because you know he's got his ordinary speaking voice, as mm-hmm. you know those of us who've seen the Blues Brothers know. And uh, but uh, yeah. his individual voices for each Muppet character are really quite quite different, except for not at all different. They're totally all just his normal speaking voice. Yeah, Yoda to Grover <laughs> to Miss Piggy to. Um... Mm-hmm. Uh, the Fozzie Bear, and, uh, yeah, American World Grover in, in to... London. Yeah. Oh, Mister Kessler. <laughs> <laughs> it's, totally... the, it's almost oh. yeah, or it's like seeing like like seeing like, like, some, somewhere there is. I think on the on the original on the original NBC show. We don't need alcohol for this, Jeremy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> when Co- Conan O'Brien had, I think before. This would have been, I think, sometime in the mid-aughts, but Conan O'Brien had on uh, Sasha Baron Cohen, who did Ooh. Ali G, um, Borat, and, um, <laughs> oh, God. Uh, Bruno or something? Yeah, Bruno, but did uh, what rapidly cut, rapidly be switched Ooh. between characters, like, uh, well, in a conversational tone. And it's one of the, like I said, it's, it is the... Um, one of the most uncanny, disturbing things ever. And he's like, he's a freaky, like wizard level genius. Yeah, he's a brilliant. He's guy. like, he like kind of literally scares me because no one should have that much intellect and ability in one body. Like it's it's ridiculous. But you know, his his family is so incredibly super duper brilliant, high end that mm-hmm. it kind of makes sense that. If he was gonna like go into the the, the silliness profession, <laughs> that he would he would be bringing that level to it. Yeah, I think we were. Uh, yeah, we were denied a thing. Well, the original of the plan they somebody flouted a few years back of having a, a having a, a period Sherlock Holmes movie only with him as mm-hmm, Holmes mm-hmm. and Will oh, Ferrell as Watson. So yeah, they just let them go. You know, he, yeah, okay, here, you know, here's here's eight, oh, here, here's eighty million dollars. You have four months. Go make Maybe a movie. Maybe it's not too late. Seriously, we can still have that. That's true. I you can... mean, all more the more Sherlock Holmeses, the better. I want all of the Sherlock Holmeses. Just give them to me. I've never, I've never seen or experienced one that made me feel anything less than yay. That was awesome. So yeah, that would that would totally that would that would make my life very very happy. Including the TV movie, the TV TV movie adaptation of the Seven Percent Solution. Including that. What, what about um. What's uh, the mouse one? Oh, the, the great mouse detective. Mouse detective. Fantastic. Yeah. I, I love that. Radigan. Oh, Radigan. Oh, Radigan. Oh, man. <laughs> He's the best. That was, that was mid-80s uh, Don Bluth, wasn't it? It was indeed. Okay. Uh, at the top of his game. And just the songs in it are so good. And the animation is so good. And yeah, it's it's, well, it's not, a really well, wonderful movie. Not, anyway. Don't, don't, don't forget the next generation Star Trek, you know, the Moriarty. Oh, yeah. Love him, too. Was, was yeah. Uh, the the really sympathetic the anti-hero episodes of just like, you know what? People who aren't Moriarty are wrong and they should go fuck themselves. <laughs> That's pretty much where I get from that episode. And, you know, with, you know, Captain Picard just being like, just fangirling kind of and trying not to because, you know, Moriarty's a criminal and Picard's very anti-criminal. But like even by the by the end of that episode, even Picard is seduced. Moriarty, he's the best, the absolute best. He set up kind of that arch enemy duality between mm-hmm. him and Data. And mm-hmm. The, the, the professor X versus Magneto. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. This, this is what happens. Brotherhood when, of Evil Mutants. Yeah, yeah. yeah. When, uh, <laughs> when an unstoppable force meets an immovable object, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and they both and and were both allowed just to chew scenery. And that time it was <laughs> Moita. I was say they got six X Men films out of that. That's economy. the problem yeah. with the Crow mm-hmm. is that there is no unstoppable force it's true. i mean or the, or the crow is the unstoppable force and he has he doesn't have a wall no wall to hit against he's just he's just going on this revenge killing spree mm-hmm. and he's he's holding and he's miserable stack deck and, and uh you know, taking care of people and you know looking the, after folks at the cop shop but mostly he just is angry and he goes and he kills people horribly at the and, end yeah and which he, yeah, if you would, uh, I think you as the comics, the I don't know, the uh, ostensible most comics professional out of all of us, uh, would you be able to run down the, could you give a, a quick uh, summary of the original four with the caliber? I don't think I can, actually, because I haven't read them in so incredibly long that I don't remember the 
original uh, Obar comic series, like just the straight up ones that he did. I don't remember much of the detail. I don't remember like the story detail almost at all. I only can just think of what the artwork looks like. Okay. And just the sort of overwhelming like psychological space that the artwork in those in those titles kind of puts you in. But the actual, like, the specifics of the story are kind of lost to me. I mean, it's been, like, 27, 28 years since I read those. And I wasn't able to, and, you know, I foolishly didn't get, you know, the comic series out of the library in these intervening weeks because I'm bad. I'm a bad person. (laughs) I remember a scene where the crow uh, kills someone. Um, And that's about it. No, um... (laughs) That never happened. One, yeah, narrow one, that down. One, one of his victims, like I guess there, there's a fight scene, and then uh, the the crow has some sort of like um, sword or something, and he cuts his legs off. Oh, it's a katana. Yeah, it's and he's, and, and he's like just sitting there, not knowing that his legs are cut off, and the the and uh, the crow is just kind of uh, calmly sitting with him. It's like you're gonna bleed to death now. Yeah, that's, yeah. Why, that's why it's getting colder. It's cool, bro. I'm not mad at you. Just this is what's happening. Yeah, that, <laughs> I ain't even mad at it. It's like I, I got, bleeding out. I got it out mad. of my system, so now you're just gonna you're just gonna die and all matter effectly. And I got stuff to wow, do. That's grim. I bet, but I mean that that, that left the most. But that's kind of cool. That that left a big, big impression on me about the character. That he's he's really kind of. He's a monster. He's, he's a one-issue voter. <laughs> yeah, but sp- spread over four issues. Um, More Frank Miller than Frank Miller. And yet, uh, well, I think yet, yeah, I think originally created at the well, at least at the same time the series the series was kind of brought into being over the the. The, you know the the same early '80s arc that of Frank Miller's rise to prominence of, mm-hmm. of, on Daredevil stuff. That's certainly the the context in which I was you know sort of handed the comics and said, "Hey man, read this. It's really extreme." And uh, because uh, some of the very first sort of you know non childhood comics that I ever read were um, the Dark Knight. Returns and you know Frank Miller's work on on those things and so I was really into it obviously because mm-hmm. it's really really good and also like the nihilism of it really appealed to me at that particular time I mean it still kind of does but um, uh, we've had all these years to you know to add Frank Miller context um, with the Crow um, it's a different kind of nihilism I think I think it's a lot less. It's a lot more individually personal, I think. Very, very much so. Um, much more born from intense personal trauma. Mm-hmm. It, it's... Yeah, because, I mean, what's ever happened to Frank Miller? I mean, he was mugged, and he took it very hard. And hence we have Frank Miller. Right. And that's really that, you know, it was it was his sort of like, you know, it, it was, what is that? The primal scene, uh, to to use a Freudian term of the... You know, it actually describes, you know, when a kid walks into, walks in on his parents having sex and it just like freaks him out and they're damaged forever from that point. That's but, you know, I, I didn't know that about, about Miller. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that probably happened, too, because like really his relationships with women are really a bit, they're a little bit weird. But no, mostly his being mugged in New York City. Was he mugged by a woman? Because maybe. <laughs> Maybe, maybe, I'm not, I'm not, maybe I'm that's the secret. Um, in, his, in his in his in his current recollections, <laughs> I'm, I'm, not, I'm, only, I'm not laughing because it was a Muslim like, woman. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and that's how in, yeah, in, in niqab and leather pants. Yeah, and, and, and that's somehow you know, hey, that, maybe that explains Dave Sim. You never know, <laughs> <laughs> right? Well, well, well Frank, for... Frank Miller always has very uh, ruthless and very powerful women. Yeah, in, yeah. In, in I mean, stories. and uh, in a lot of ways, he really kind of, um, I think that he believes that he's really kind of like elevating the status of women by showing that they can be just as bloodthirsty and cold blooded as men. Um, Almost too like, but yeah. With, but but it, at the same time, it's like, uh, you forgot to actually not, add a real character. They're not really hum- humanized at all. They're, yeah. they're, they're kind of, they're kind of a... Uh, 
it's it's like very obviously they're com- coming dames. From, it, it, it's a fetishized yes. look at um, yeah. yeah, like what the you you can obviously like see into the what the creator was was trying to to to, to show right mm-hmm. and um but yeah i think it's it's the it's that fetish it's the it's that fetishized ob- uh that the, the fetishized aspect not just all of the sin city the hyper um hyper stylization from St- sim city but uh sim city <laughs> <laughs> Dave, frank miller's frank sim miller's city. dave sims <laughs> dave sim city 2000 um <laughs> So, I would play that every day. Yeah, an, an, uh, yeah a, 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 a hyper misogynist noir set in a in an urban environment that you build and have to like you know allocate roadways and taxes. That sounds so great. But, but it's like, did you did you see his um God? What was it? It was like his holy war, holy war, oh, holy t- yes. like his like his holy like rejected war, holy terror. his rejected oh. Batman script that was turned into featured like not Batman and not Catwoman, but a not Catwoman that's even more hypersexualized. I think at one point they straight out just get it on, you know, besides all of the uh him mocking, you know, mocking various democratic uh politician, but just at some point, yeah, not Batman and not Catwoman. I'm trying to remember if they actually do full on just get, you know, get it on in their um you know, explicitly get it on in this strange hyper politicized pre new 52 um rendition. I I I haven't even seen it. No, because I haven't I have I've only seen like one individual page of it because it was it's owned by a former colleague of mine, mm-hmm. you know, who was Frank's representation and editor for a really long time. Hmm. So she has a lot of a lot of Frank originals and uh it's a pretty nice page, but at the same time it's kind of yeah, uh, uh I'm not really even sure how to describe it. Um, it wasn't that anyway. It was not a page uh, depicting Batman and Catwoman doing the uh, making the the beast with of two, the night with two backs, as yeah. it were, um, yeah. which would have been so fabulous if it were. The be- the, more like the beast with two bats. Um. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, it's a. Uh, but I haven't actually read the the project at all because I'm just you know it's certainly at the time that it came out I was like I really I kind of don't actually need that kind of negativity in my mind right now. This is a little more than I can than I feel would be entertainment. Yeah, but bringing back in terms, uh, bringing it back to I guess on the aspect of entertainment, but also Frank Miller's work is you know as he went on is it's almost like this is what happens if you let um, '80s comics brutality just keep going on and on and on for decades later, which mm. is. At least, especially, um, I'll give a quick summary of the of the comics. I think I reread them, reread them uh, in preparation for our uh, first attempt at the show, <laughs> which was more more uh, more weeks ago than I would want care to admit easily. Back when we were young, yeah. But the I think the initial story is is far more this kind of very bar- uh, a story that um, like matches its, its the art style and that it's far more stripped down. Very black and white, but you know you have this young young couple in passionate like um you know romance lit major uh passionate um in love and ready to be married but uh, living in Detroit but I think what is it the, the driving along and doing this from ill prepared memory instead of like you know reading it on the <laughs> well, <laughs> I could read it off the Wikipedia but <laughs> They were they were they were totally presented in like romance novel cover imagery of yeah. like their relationship. They've got they both got long, fantastic hair, and, and it's sort of blowing in a light breeze until and, it's all ruined, and then it, yeah, and, and then they're soaked in blood, which just kind of makes it look cooler. Yeah, but but I mean, it's like they, they keep juxtaposing. This is the romance novel cover that we're trying to get back to, and this <laughs> mm-hmm. is what we long for, and this is what is mm-hmm. you know Eric Draven is obsessed by this. The, you know this angelic by this harlequin what's... thing <laughs> but it's, it's but it's not because it but and it's but it's so it's so stripped down the they don't even have last names it is oh. just it's not it's not eric graven and shelly webster mm-hmm. it is eric and shelly mm-hmm. um i mean screw it i want i'm i'm kind of curious what yeah. the what the actual wick uh, the with the wiki synopsis of this says um as we were this is the uh this is the uh 
if this isn't the if, if this isn't the modern Webster's dictionary just finds such and such as this is the wiki uh, the the wiki plot synopsis for the comics. I just edited that like twenty minutes ago, so it's all <laughs> wrong. Just so you know, I anticipated this. The story revolves around an unfortunate young man named Eric. He and his fiancée, Shelly, are assaulted by a gang of street thugs after their car breaks down. Eric is shot in the head and is paralyzed, and can only watch as Shelly is savagely beaten, raped, and shot in the head. Ooh. They are then left for, dead, left for dead on the side of the road. Eric later dies in the hospital operating room while Shelly is DOA. He is resurrected by a crow and seeks vengeance on the murderers, methodically kill, stalking and killing them. When not on the hunt, Eric stays in the house he shared with Shelly, spending most of his time there lost in memories of her. Her absence is torture for him. He is in emotional pain, even engaging in self-mutilation by cutting himself. The crow acts as both guide and goad for Eric, giving him information that helps him in his quest, but also chastising him for dwelling on Shelly's death seeing his pining, pining as useless self-indulgence that distracts him from his purpose. <laughs> there we go. That's um, a <laughs> couple hundred couple hundred word summary of the crow. The in, end. Uh, the end, yeah. Wow. It, yeah, I do I do remember that it gave you a lot more insight into his... That the crow is directly talking to him and saying, no, go do this thing, do it specifically, and stop being such a whiny little baby. Go kill that guy in the worst possible possible way and that will be as close to you feeling good ever again that you'll ever experience laters <laughs> I, I mean when i the age i was when i read that stuff i i knew people going through a lot of <laughs> yeah inner turmoil i mean everybody's got depression and feels like an outsider and they're like yeah, but 12 and 13 on the other hand you know how many of them were you know assaulted by a gang of street thugs and then shot in the head and then forced to watch while you well, know the, they gang rape your girlfriend well, and then she dies and then you die that's why it, that that's why it's a popular you know story <laughs> because that you don't have to now now you can just in, you know in, enjoy you can enjoy the catharsis in, you know enjoy what fun that sounds like yeah it uh, does sound great doesn't it is that you I could use a vacation. There's got to be someone has. Let's see. <laughs> I don't you can know get a, any street thugs, though. I, I think the movie kind of got away from his own, like, uh, I guess, mental health issues um, as uh, resurrected. Oh, no, I'd say they definitely, they definitely uh, um, uh, address that quite a bit. Um, I mean, that's what half of the songs on the soundtrack are about. Um, and he does do um, that thing where he uh, uses the um, the brace on the uh, broken rose circular window as a sort of you know pull up bar, which is and he does it very angstfully. Yeah, nice. and uh, jumps up, you know, swings out, grabs yeah, it, gives, and then it, comes, comes back, back in, and it's his... like really he's not just filled with sadness; he's now also like physically pumped and is ready to to uh, go, go and, and kill those guys. But also then when he in, is talking to Albrecht all those times, like he's really, he's playing up kind of his insanity in a way that makes the viewer wonder whether or not he's kind of faking the insanity because he's so clearly like messing with Albrecht's head and just being like, I'm nutso. And Albrecht is like, crazy dude, please stop being crazy. Mm. Um, I guess I guess I just I just meant that it, I, it's uh, be, because it was. But he's not like paralyzed with grief. So it would be it was it was cleaned up to the extent for for the mass the audience. Movie. Yeah, for, yeah, for mass audience. So the, it, the it just didn't feel like uh, as uh, straightforward, messy. pure, or messy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it wasn't as messy. Well, it wasn't. It, it, he it wasn't as complex a character. He didn't have. As, as his dark side was just that, you know, that, that it, w it was obviously he was wanting to take revenge for what happened, but otherwise mm -hmm. he seemed like a pretty reasonable and nice guy. Yeah. Uh, in the book, you know, you to be a zombie. <laughs> or Revenant, yeah. Oh, oh Revenant. Sorry, a, a leak, sorry zombies. A, isn't it a, a leak or a leak? Li li lich. A, a, I think a, a, a lich. A hemi-demi lich. I think he's more. I think, but isn't a lich 
uh, a lich is much more... There there were minions of the necromancer that raised them, right? Or is that yeah. more of a... And, uh, uh, so yeah, but it's more of a... Yeah, he's, he's far more revenant who just, you know, dude from back from the dead. Yeah, without than... a particular, like, direct logical explanation as to why this guy you know why he's alive now uh, it's just the spirit of the crow animated him if you bite too do you reason. become a zombie too or i don't know i don't think i don't know, think <laughs> we see him bite also. anybody he should have you know tried yeah. that um but i guess he didn't want any of them even to you know rise from the dead he just yeah. wanted to make sure they were like dead dead but you know like a like a friend it, yeah do you want to yeah brutal. like you want to hang out for another you know ever like, until you know the Till the Earth's mantle is burned off of, uh, off of the core, and the sun goes nova. And the sun goes nova. You want to hang out? I Sounds think. Good. I think the whole story would have been so much cooler to me, uh, um, in far as like what it meant. Uh, if the crow was ugly, mm-hmm. if the crow um, wore makeup because he was so repulsive or so mulet or whatever but, 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 the, yeah the later fil- the later films get into me. that where the make where the makeup and the the facial design is a result more of scarring than than pretty boy than affectation than, yeah than pretty well, boy affectation I'm, I'm glad that that finally the later crow films are you know finally got it and that's that's where the <laughs> it only took them 20 years but well, well you know and, so so <laughs> Sure, but 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 I mean, you know, it's you have. And a then, lot. of course, for some reason, uh, just a minor interjection that because, of course, they're remaking it again, starring Jason Momoa, who is one of the most naturally, incredibly beautiful men that's ever lived. Why are they casting another gorgeous dude in that? Because you know, clearly, we want him to, you know, have a quite mutilated face. Um, I, don't know, I guess maybe they just cast him for his sick, sick body. Yeah, but th- th- that's that's a thing. It's like the audiences. Get to uh, get, you know, the, he's a massive, massive goth the, dork. <laughs> the, the soft sex appeal of getting to see like this mm-hmm. rippling muscle body. Like, yeah. You get to see Brendan and you get to see. I mean, what if, what if uh, the crow was a fat guy? Yeah. Like, would, would like what? What if the crow, uh, like, was resurrected and, and like became hugely kind of bloated? White, white makeup. You know, put on the white makeup and and just didn't have good posture and kind of looked like <laughs> regular people that you would see like but if, waiting I, for I, I think with the, the aspect of the visual look is that be, uh, again we're dealing with goth here goth. no check that idealized goth here idealized goth I, idealized not, goth. not goth. real world goth yeah, not street level because I've been to some goth clubs and I mean there's, <laughs> they look yeah, like you and they're, me they're, yeah. they're, they're not they're not like wraiths <laughs> well, some of thing. them are the lucky some of them ones. Yes, yeah, Eric. Yeah, both Eric and Shelley in the books are drawn very, um, like I said, I, a very ideal, you know, ro- idealized, romanticized uh, mm-hmm. goth of, you know, Eric. Like this full on. It's kind of what would happen. Oh, look, let's take the idea uh, that um, that's who. The, that's who he's. De- he, I just realized he's 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 drawn to look like a hypermuscular. Well. At least a muscular Peter Murphy. Yes, yes, which oh. of course is basically all any of us has ever wanted. Yeah. Kind of. I mean, I don't need the muscular version, but you know, I wouldn't say no to the muscular version. But a muscular Peter Murphy, sure. More, um, yeah, more so than because Ian Curtis was didn't, never really had that visual aspect. Even you know, he, he you know he was a, kind of a skinny, so gawky guy. Yeah, he he wasn't the was so but he wasn't a guy running around without a shirt on. That was no, he could have, and I wouldn't have minded, but you know he certainly wouldn't do that with his incredibly low self-esteem and even in the i think in the in the in trivia that you read about the i really need to find that book the trivia about the making the movie brandon lee had to drop like you know voluntarily dropped Mm. 20 pounds Mm -hmm. of muscle i'm doing the peter murphy diet right now (laughs) What, what what lots sh- and lots of meth yeah it was like and that's sh- it. Sh- shooting uh, yeah how much you you know how much are you shooting up meth every, on and a, a gigantic and a, and a spliff as long as your arm yeah. and that's pretty much it and the occasional jack and coke and oh, that's pretty much how okay. he's maintained his girlish figure all these years he's got some substance abuse problems he kind of does a little bit he's a he's, he's a very nice person from what i'm told you know, in, in speaking of injecting I think he's he's normal, really. He's nice sometimes, and sometimes he's awful. But you know, I, he's I, he's a normal he's a normal person. My my friends uh, opened up for him at mm. the Aladdin last year. Oh, nice! And uh, 
uh, the the, the she's nice to other musicians. Well, <laughs> we would certainly hope to. Like the only other, you know, who's going to understand him. What I hear, he actually went out of his way to say, "Oh, hey, I loved you." You know, he started, Aww. and then he he, he I, fangirled at them. Yeah, and I think Aww. he, I, and then he wanted to kind of like hang out and stay up all night, like talking He's and stuff. He was, oh, he was. God. I mean, I like it from, from like she He's told got me. Adult I'm, children. He should not be begging bands to hang out with them no, afterwards. No, I think he should like send the tour bus and call his kids and his wife back in Turkey and just be like, "How are you guys? You know, do you guys need anything? I'll be back in like two or three weeks. Yeah, cool. I love you. Bye." But you know, I guess he just he he, he wanted to feel the sparkle of youth again. Well, the, it was like, what, what point were you gonna make? <laughs> yes, your oh, point. Sorry. Yeah, what about about Peter Murphy wanted to hang out and chat all night and? Oh, I, I was just gonna say I I think that might have been not all coming from a place of just kindness and goodwill, but also maybe a little bit of whatever he was using for you know for the show. He, I, he was definitely. I, I genuinely I, don't, I, I don't judge him for like uh, like amphetamine use because he's in his mid fifties and he has to like tour globally and do lots and lots and lots of shows yeah, and yeah. he's you know he's in he's in much better shape than he was but it's still completely exhausting so yeah. you know if he wants to do some meth okay I, sure but just the I think just the image of him up all night and like just want. Um, it's straight on Krusty the Clown oh, won't leave. <laughs> like it's, oh, let's, let, oh, look, wedding albums. I just want to go home. Peter, we don't want to see your vacation slides a third time. <laughs> I know, Iceland was gorgeous, right. but like we really got to go to bed, man. And, but yeah, the, but the band thing is it's part of, uh, uh, endemic to the crow, not only just the, the soundtrack to the film, which mm. they did cover a couple... Uh, a couple Joy Division songs yeah. for the thing, which yes. I mean, you have, uh, but goth and alt rock and you know, de- uh, check that death, death rock. rock. <laughs> there we go, death rock and kind of post punk were just shot through the book. You have, you know, mm-hmm. uh, co- cops named after Joy Division members. Oh, um, right, the Albrecht. Yeah, mm-hmm. there's like there's like at one point his dialogue. He's the, the character is a full on walking. You know his own version of MST3K of just spouting reference, you know, quoting everything from like, you know, uh, Byron and Shelley to like, I mean, they're Comset Angel reference, <laughs> Angels references that are like, oh, like, wow. cure lyrics, book chapters named after, uh, named after Is he um, me. <laughs> yeah, book chapters named after Joy Division songs, and there's the, the cure stuff in there, but very. Um, That's what I do like all yeah. day long, and almost nobody gets it. Well, because <laughs> like most of what most of my like nonstop quotes are Talking Heads lyrics. And or Radiohead lyrics, and you can just insert those in a normal conversation, and no one can actually tell because the lyrics are made out of ordinary conversation. And uh, but nonetheless, it's always really fun to you know. I'm like that with Simpsons quotes. Yeah, yeah um, Simpsons quotes aren't really like normal conversation unless you're just quoting normal conversation on The Simpsons. That's true. I think for me, it's more of I can't turn I can't turn off the ref- the internal the inter- internal reference the reference machine. And, right. <laughs> It's like a ticker tape, but yeah, but get the but the part of the book, like I said, it's it's stark. The character is stark. Like at some point, he's he's straight out. Obar, it's always told, it's said that um, that James Obar wrote this, you know, as a response to both, you know, he just kind of senselessly lost his girlfriend, girlfriend or fiance to uh, a drunk driver, which mm-hmm. screwed him up pretty bad. Mm-hmm. When at one point he went went into the army, was over in the army in the early eighties over in Germany, and I think read a newspaper account of in Detroit you had you had a couple that was mugged and killed uh, for an engagement ring right and so you have the two bits of that kind of fed into here you know him wanting to um, uh, you know it's, it's, you know express it through art in terms of this of, mm-hmm. and the that, that, that gave that gave him his in as yeah. I like to call it just gives him the tag to then build upon and that's why I watch so much TV you guys I'm looking for the next I'm looking for the tag to find something to then be able to base an entire like you know to base 90,000 words of prose on and uh, you know I got like 18 of those <laughs> backed up for me to actually do now I have the inspiration now I should probably watch less TV and do more writing 
only 100 and, what, 168 hours in a week? That's right. And, oh. uh, yeah, I should really, yeah. Um, anyway, let's not talk about the fact that I'm just not producing anything right did, now. Did anyone ever try and do a Crow TV series? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, right? From the, uh, uh, mentioned it, I think we briefly mentioned it last time, but it was it was one of those in the wake of... Was it a Saturn, Saturday morning cartoon? <laughs> Saturday afternoon <Crow> syndication. babies. <laughs> In the way you will think, remember back, you know, it was the it was so the nineties. Like yeah. So you have your post, you know, uh, thanks to Next Generation, be proving that syndication could be mm-hmm. was a viable thing. You had all of these. You had the magic that is Forever Night. Oh yes, which I think it just wound up not mm. went from being was it went from being syndicated and just wound up on USA or was the maybe it was the other way around. It was the other way around because uh, Forever Night is a is an entirely Canadian production, and so uh, I think USA was just sublicensing sublicensing it from there and then kept it going, but also USA's money in grabbing it for syndication to put it on that station gave it enough money to Continue. have a yeah to have a, a final season to actually wrap up the overarching story which was apparently happening all the time which um yeah there's no way there's no actual overarching story they decided all of a sudden that there was an overarching study and they were just like oh if we were to conclude this we need a whole nother season of 22 episodes so about six of those episodes are relevant and then the rest of them are um well Forever Night. It's a challenging show. It's not for everybody. Yeah, it's like taking your movie and decide taking your movie or more importantly just kind of random random IP intellectual property and mm-hmm. it's like we're going to build an entire film film franchise universe out of this. Mm-hmm. Oh, it didn't work. Okay. And especially yeah. doing that of something that in trying to retrofit that uh, that aspect onto your movie license. Mm-hmm. The So the Crow television issue uh, is, inform us. But it, it's I remember very, there's I remember something about it, but it's like the details completely escape me. But it, it's very much the in the kind of like post her per, no not just Hercules, Xena. Mm, yeah. you, had all, you had all these syndicated genre shows, your Andromeda, your your Hercules your and then Cleopatra Xena. Cleopatra sixty nine, sixty nine. <laughs> Wait, was that was that sixty nine or twenty five twenty five? No, twenty five twenty five. It right. really was sixty nine sixty nine. I mean they just change the the numbers to make it more palatable but. and yeah we and we we it's did such a, a great show we and we i think we mentioned in a previous episode uh bruce campbell's jack of all trades oh yeah good old was, jack of all trades which was paired with that mm-hmm. but that's but into that mix of kind of you know not the best budget but all but it's kind of like uh, taking the crow as episodic television Almost, you know, borderline procedural mm-hmm. of like he helps people out, and it's it's but it, and it's shot. It, I think they, it was like shot in Vancouver, but it's it's very it's much more mm. sunny. It's like shot in daylight, mm-hmm. and it just it just looks really it's it looks very very weird. Completely like wait, as if they just mm-hmm. hey, we have this we have we have the rights to this property. Let's throw it into this model of he's like the equalizer. <laughs> yeah. Yes, <laughs> of murder with with uh, only with longer darker hair. Yeah. And making and, and not a shirt. Yeah, and making much. Although uh, <laughs> that's the thing. That's Did the uh, equalizer the, take his shirt off. No, it's it's the crow oh, as God. Lorenzo. It's the crow Shh. as Lorenzo Lamas's renegade, <laughs> <laughs> where he's you know long long dark hair, black leather, rides a motor. Really does you ride a, even joke about ride a, that, ride a motor rides a motorcycle. Oh, yeah, wow. ladies and gentlemen, you can go find. I think almost every, of course we live in the modern era, so almost every it's episode. It's on YouTube, I'm sure. Is, is, yeah, it's on YouTube in full. <sighs> like, um, do you have that. a tragedy that you've experienced in your life? Are you seeking revenge and are <laughs> are, are are torn apart with uh, with, with grief and do you anger? Like and, yeah. <laughs> do you have no outlet for this? Well, I am Eric Draven. Yeah. I'm. I am an undead hitman for hire. I have no foil. I just I just stalk until they die. Mm-hmm. If you can find them, then maybe you can hire the crow. And then he walks away sad and alone at the end of every episode, like the Incredible Hulk. Yeah, and somehow, and for some reason, carrying a backpack. And yeah, where it gave <sighs> and a crow on his shoulder and a, and, a, and a guitar and much. Oh my God! And, and worst a, goth cliche in the universe. And, oh and that kind God. of like that kind of shitty Jackson looking <laughs> Ibanez as Jackson looking metalhead guitar mm-hmm. mixed with um, and katana. Wow. Um, 
which is all, like funny how the crow led into uh, all, at the same you know it, as was the style of the times of the eighties how the how the comic crow as was the style at the time could bleed into you know so you know all the the visual tropes fed into say eighty cyberpunk at the same mm-hmm. time oh well, I'm, yeah I'm, I'm thinking about that long haired guy with the katana who like got got uh got stopped some sort of crime on the max oh yeah yeah <laughs> he's really cute like i was but, like did somebody get his number get he, him representation well, like he's he got a good like, face he seemed like the the, the caliber press yeah. comics reading type yeah. what was the story behind that a uh, guy who uh a hippie touristy guy um not an actual uh portland local but like uh visiting from somewhere else in on the west coast slash he brought, pacific northwest he or brought his katana with him and he had his katana with him and there was like an altercation with some mean guys like menacing a woman on the max and he whipped out the katana and then put foot to ass and ran off the the perps the entire max car burst into applause they took everybody took his picture by the time he got off the max like news cameras were there to greet him and he's just like no i just you know it was the right thing to do of course i was you know of course i was gonna you know defend this you know de- defend these people you know who were you know they didn't ask for that yeah. and they're like but you have a katana and he's like well yeah is the mo- like the modern hippie ronin is that yeah. even a, i didn't even know that was allowed on the max i don't think it is kind of not like, but all at the same time i, I guess you don't, make, you don't make if you don't make a or? if you don't make a thing out of it yeah you can kind of bring your katana on the, you know like wrap it up in you know in a giant teddy bear or something or a violin case but you know then if you see some like malfeasance going down it's like open carry i'm totally for open carry with yeah katana. totally i agree it's, it's, i think we should in fact all have blade weapons like just everybody i think we should be assigned them when I, we hit puberty the, i'm sorry i have to push back you know of course you're leading us down the dark future where sword canes <laughs> become an acceptable fashion accessory for uh, for people mm. wandering around the uh, only uh, I, pioneer I, pioneer center. I don't the only have a response with that. to a bad guy with a sword cane is a, is a good, good guy, guy with a sword cane. cane or a sword umbrella cane, or one of the or uh, you know, like it, Mycroft Holmes. And it's you know, it's just going to lead to derringers too. Yeah. Um, also derringers and then maybe tasers. Oh, and then we get into the monofilament and yeah. Pretty soon we've got a sort of cyberpunk. Yeah, and we're, for all. we're back to cyberpunk. Hey, we, <laughs> yes. Oh, dude, we, <laughs> we already we're already in our corporate in our in a modern corporate dystopia. That's right. Um, uh, was it Gibson who did the sprawl, or was it yes, Stevenson? Yes, that is. Okay. Uh, well, why uh, does the well, Second Amendment have to be a, an argument about guns? Right? It's about weapons. Yeah, it's about. It should be about I, weapons in about, general. Let's talk about you know nunchucks and katanas. Nunchucks. The, yeah. the nunchucks. The um <laughs> the obvious the obvious oh, connect. Sure. We'll use this as a transition point to, from talking about the comics <laughs> to the film. In that Brandon Lee's father's work had to be censored <gasps> in Britain because. Um, was it nunchucks? Mm-hmm. Nunchucku um, were are a banned weapon, and so if internet lore, which is, uh, is correct, which it, of course it probably it's is, it's on the internet. Of course, it's true that British film censors chopped would chop Bruce Lee's films because it's all, all of the you awesome sequences because you couldn't show. Yeah, you couldn't show the sequence. What is it? Is it? Is it Fist of Fury? Well, actually, it's not, um, it's not just Fist of Fury. It's like almost all of them are. Yeah, they? pretty much all of them. He uses Nunchaku at least once in all of them. In uh, and there's he, a movie. There, one of the three, he uses Nunchaku twice, mm-hmm. and it's pretty amazing. Um, but I don't remember which because I was so incredibly, incredibly drunk the last time I was watching Bruce Lee movies, and we had all three, and we just like shot alternate them? them each night. Oh, okay. We shotgunned them. Ha, ha, ha. No, it was uh, that time when uh, um, Thunderbird was ninety nine cents a bottle at oh uh, the uh, um, uh, whatever the grocery store was that was on Woodstock and Forty Fifth, and I lived on like Forty Seventh and like up the hill there, and none of us had anything to live for, so we just we bought like like twenty five bottles of Thunderbird and you know stocked the freezer, and then every afternoon and evening we would just sit down drink t-bird and watch bruce lee movies and so generally we'd, we would run through all three each night but they were in different order and um yeah it's just over and over again just watched all the bruce lee over and over again cue uh cue the b52's deadbeat club <laughs> <laughs> 
hey, we were recent college graduates. Yeah, that's, that's very much it. It's like if, you, if it's a certain age, if you are just... We hey, were I, living reality bites. I, I, I spent that summer uh, working at a sports bar in Ann Arbor doing a radio show and staying up till sometimes dawn, sometimes mm-hmm. sun, uh, sunrise mm-hmm. playing um, playing Xeno Gears on the PlayStation mm-hmm. 1, listening to... Uh, Listening to a lot of sunny day real estate, I think, mm-hmm. and like like you do, yeah, like you do. It was a wonderful time. Uh, I would have had a different life had I been able to get any kind of work whatsoever. So I spent my days, you know, looking for uh, raiding people's gardens and trash cans and stuff for enough food to get me through a day. <laughs> Pretty modern Portland. Yeah. Um, yep. This is what a this is what a college degree gets you, kids. Take it from me. Develop your dumpster diving skills in high school so that you've got them once you graduate from college. Oh, a pair of bolt cutters will pays for itself in like a week, I'm telling you. We uh, we like to think of ourselves as not only an informative and entertaining podcast, but also one that gives life lessons, life hacks even. Mm-hmm. To yeah, because the, the there's, dun- there's no reason in the world why anybody in the United States should ever go hungry. And uh, if you gotta, like, crack into and grab refuse that somebody else has already has thrown away, then do it. For heaven's sake, do it. It's ridiculous. There is no such such thing as waste. It's only stuff we haven't figured out what to do with yet. Exactly. And uh, I tell you, when I was dumpster diving for food, I have almost never eaten so fantastically well in my life. Those were the golden time. Before they started locking dumpsters, really, and, you know, with all these, like, nice, natural, hippie grocery stores around town, they didn't lock their dumpsters, so, you know, it was hip-deep and, like, delicious organic foods that were, like, three days before their sell-by date, which meant that they'd be good for another several weeks after that, and that was wonderful. So, would you say that... Oh, sorry. (laughs) I was was going to ask... Would so would you suggest that Bruce Lee films encourage freeganism or just only or mainly just accompany them? I would say that they definitely make a fine accompaniment to um, anybody experiencing a lower a, a lower class kind of existence, not in a you know moral or pejorative way, but in a socioeconomic way. That really once you you know once you've pounded the pavement all day trying to you know and come home with like seventy eight cents. Sitting down and then watching Bruce Lee beat up a bunch of motherfuckers makes you feel a lot better about life. And well, it gives you the motivation to get up the next day and do it again. Also, it's 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 a it's a great um, it's a great parallel about learning the rules mm-hmm. to Discipline. eventually to eventually be able to break them. Exactly for your own. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and and learning like just the discipline and the that, dedication to that you. is the uh, the Jeet Kune Do <laughs> model of you know understanding and learning you know, kung fu traditional uh, learn the rules fighting so that you can break them right but then making it your own uh, so so you know you see a dumpster it's locked you realize they don't want you stealing the food but. It's it's bound for the it, landfill now, anyway. It's now, bound for the landfill. It's almost definitely still good. Mm, if you don't have to use the bolt cutters, don't, because that means that they then have to replace whatever uh, security measures they were using. On the other hand, it's better to do that than to go hungry. So yeah, you know that's right. That's where I stand. They, they put I'm a socialist. The, they put the chains there. Mm-hmm. Yep. And they're gonna run me out of the. They're gonna run me out of the nation pretty soon. In a couple of days, they're gonna they're gonna come with the pitchforks and the torches and the bits of broken up furniture and say, socialist, get out of town. You have compassion for people who haven't worked their whole lives. <laughs> or who have, but who don't have enough for whatever reason we can't really. But I'm sure it's their own fault, and I'll be like uh, guilty you, as charged. You want to help people who need help? Yes. Ah. <laughs> oh, come now. I was say this is Portland. It'll take the it'll take the the, the, the angry hordes at least a couple of years to make it out this far. No, man, they have trucks, dude. They have trucks. I've seen them. They're in town already. They're waiting for me to slip up. I've seen them. I've seen them. I've, you know, I've had sometimes pleasant conversations with a few of them, but at the same time, I could see, see behind their eyes that they were just, they were just waiting. For, they're waiting for the signal to come. I saw, I saw a truck with a, with, a, with a Trump Pence bumper sticker. Mm-hmm. 
Oh, I've only seen one so far, but I, well, that's good. I was. Sorry. It's still very just like I, seen mm -hmm. I, seen I see a lot more like Lexuses with Trump fence stickers on. Them. That, that's strange. <laughs> I don't. I don't even understand that. Uh, it's because they just hate people who are. They don't like women, and they don't feel that reproductive choice is uh, is a moral thing. Just and people who own Lexuses. Um, they often own Lexuses, yeah, oh, yeah. because, you yeah. know, if you, if you don't have very much compassion for your fellow man, or if you don't have any, in fact, it really helps you get a leg up in business. Yeah, the social, the, when they actually analyze the socioeconomic, um, what are the averages of your average, uh, Trump, Trumpins? Sure. Trumpins mm -hmm. and Trump support. Is, it is, no, it is, They it, certainly it is, earn a lot more money than I do. Yeah, it is, it is remarkably above average. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, yeah. yeah, no, they just, they well, just I, specifically dislike they don't like Democrats and they're American exceptionalists and they don't like Mexicans and oh. they don't they don't like brown people from a different border in any particular like when they say they don't like foreigners I doubt that any of them totally hates Canadians right. or <laughs> Irish people or, or, the, or, or Ukrainians or, or like Czechs or Polish yeah folks like or... like those gorgeous long-legged chicks from Serbia <laughs> I don't think they mind those foreigners but but the brown ones no But getting back to things destined for the dumpster, as well as violence, <laughs> yeah. The Crow film was after the, after the ons, <laughs> and this is what ha uh, you could say. Part of what happens if um, if you go to a non-union state like North Carolina, mm -hmm. for the very same reason why many many companies have large manufacturing operations oh. there, including companies that started and are headquarters in Portland, Oregon, headquartered in Portland, Oregon. They filmed it in Wilmington, mm -hmm. where on a, if not a non-union crew, at least a place where, um, where uh, safety and or you know operating regs were very loosely interpreted. Yes, let's let's give them that because I don't think it was, I mean negligence, absolutely, but. Well, there were at least there were no safety mishaps on the set of the crow. <laughs> That's well. That's the thing. Yeah, they were. Uh, they, they, you know, at the time, they were like, "Was they talking Come about it without was cursed, a hitch?" Yeah, <laughs> they cursed, shot it so quickly, dude. <laughs> yeah, curse production. Yeah, they 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 went beyond it. To the point oh. where like people were getting like, what is it? A couple guys got electrocuted. Um, yeah. One of the things is that because it was such a rushed production and underfunded, um, I think the the onset was the onsite the onset. Uh, I remember reading. Read a lot about the. In fact, there's even a couple books about just the produ the production of the film. Mm. One of the bits is people were talking about how they, you know, like yeah, they're trying to, they're, you know, they're trying because the film itself was only given maybe like 18 million. They're like, yeah, they're trying to get, a, they're trying to make a 30 million uh, dollar film mm -hmm. out of like 18 million, mm -hmm. and you cut a lot of quarters doing that, including having uh, well, you know, established and well trained. Um, Prop weapons handlers, mm -hmm. so that the what it, and we're, we're, uh, I don't know how, how much detail do should we get into the onset accident of like what actually? Oh, we should definitely get into detail about it. It's really that's the reason why anybody really. I mean, it's not the reason why people think about or know about the crow, but it was absolutely instrumental in making the movie the hit that it was, a, a, into a giving thing. it that sort of cultural cachet that it had. Because I mean, this is. It, an onset death is still a very of, of an actor. The lead actor is right, just actor. simply it's not something that happens. And it wasn't like a, something fell on him. He, yeah. he was shot. He was shot by his co-star who when they were horsing around. Oh, I thought it was actually filming a scene. No, it was it actually filming a scene? It was no, it was filming. It, oh, it, for heaven's it sake! Was oh, during, yeah, that's right. During the it, during the there's a scene in the film. One of the uh, I think one of the well, what it later became a flashback because um, if you cut things into flashbacks, you can um, you don't you can show things out of order and you don't need to have right and you can then like reshoot those bits with a stand in. Yes. Yeah. But the. What shoot? <laughs> I can't remember if it. What was it? Fun Boy. It was the. Um, it it uh, it it was the uh, the the morphine addict. Yeah. Uh, Who? Uh, uh, Michael. Uh, Michael Wincott. 
No, not no. Not Michael Wincott. Um, I can't what's remember. his name? Uh, he just passed away like eight days ago. The the blonde guy. The no, not hair? the blonde guy, but the guy with the long hair and the drawn face and. The man who actually shot Brandon Lee to death, oh, he just died a few days ago, actually. And it's really sad because uh, the only, the headline that he was given to announce his passing was actor such and such killed Brandon Lee in onset <laughs> accident. And they didn't, like, the headline has says nothing whatsoever about any That's of his hard. other acting That's roles. Terrible. And so those of us who are fans of his work were just, you know, out, absolutely outraged. Uh, I wasn't outraged because I'm uh, too busy going through way too much emotional stuff on my own. And I was just like, purpose. damn it. No, but Not at like the same time, say. it's like, dude. Someone was oh, thinking, now this yeah. movie's really going to be a hit. Yeah. Michael, yeah. Michael Massey. Who, Michael Massey, who played that's fun, right. I played fun Michael, boy. Yeah, Michael Wincott is also in the movie, so you, I get really confused. Michael Wincott, the, the guy, the, um, <laughs> the Canadian, the Canadian actor playing top dollar, the, uh, the international male <laughs> long, you know, uh, early nineties long, you know, long, beef long, cake. yeah, beef, long, luxurious, straight black hair. And vests and leather and um, international mail. Michael Massey was the actor's name. The you know just died died October twentieth, twenty sixteen, at the age of sixty four. Yeah. Uh, due to an uh, uh, an onset mishap, which is putting it politely. Oh really? Well, what it was was he was the one who. No, he's fine. Well, no, he died of like. No, he no he no he no he didn't die that. You know he he died. He just died, he died recently of. Uh, it's, mm. well, it doesn't say. It's, yeah, did somebody it's shoot a, a mis- projectile uh, at him? No one shot him. He's never been shot, as far as I know. I believe that he died of like you know one of those multiple organ failure type things. Yeah. Um, the, and he was never, and he was just never the same after that. Because yeah, Brandon Lee was like kind of his best friend at the time, oh. where they'd really become kind of close on set. And so, yeah, they were really they were having a really good relationship between actors who were like can you believe we're doing this crazy movie ha 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 wow it's sure unsafe here anyway let's shoot that scene but the um in the just in the details of how you of prop weapons and blanks versus actual bullets and what um you know what you shoot with what versus because uh, of just due to how they how they just you know having a, you know deciding that they needed the, the the gun pointed right, at the, you know, right at the camera. You know, camera staring right down that barrel, and you actually need to see the bullet tips. But it was a thing where, due to you know, this poss- probably due to you know everybody being exhausted and, uh, and rushed through a lot of things, and just negligence through, uh, yeah, negligence through uh, less than ideal working circumstances. The prop weapon had a. The prop weapon had was it a wadding or what is it? Was it an actual? I don't think it was it an actual bullet head, but it was kind of like part of a part it's of on a, Wikipedia. Yeah, it's on Wikipedia. I guess that's that's true. <laughs> we but can fact check on the fly. Uh, Michael Massey, that the actor, quit acting for at least a year after um, after this happened because he's like, no, I'm out of it. And Rochelle Davis, who played Sarah, the, uh, mm-hmm. you know, the, the in one of the many uh, one of the many expansions from comic series to uh to film because the comic series she, she, i think she's in like this little blonde waif very um very victor hugo um <laughs> what eponine no uh just like tragic little that is eponine yeah kind of victor victor hugo like um uh low tort i can't think of the word but um damn it let me, here, let me look this up really quick <laughs> But yeah, she. But yeah, she. The, the actress who played Sarah, she quit acting for years, uh, like for several years, and then only event just do you know, more than likely due to this before getting back into it. And let me look up the, um, the. Let me do a quick wiki look up of the detail. She got back into it when she realized that it, it can't rain all the time. <laughs> I bought the uh, I black did, coffee and cigarettes. Yeah, oh, I yeah. I didn't. Um, I uh, actually. Well, here while I look, let let us take a break. Okay. Um, because we've been going, we've been going at it for about an hour. It's about three fifteen, and let me look this up really quick, and okay. then uh, we'll get back together and chug mm-hmm. through the movies. Okay, I'm gonna go have the food. Coming back to and getting back to the uh, at least the info on how Brandon Lee actually died. It was a thing where. Yeah, Michael Massey, who plays Fun Boy, the morphine addict, 
which, which is an interesting thing they actually did they kept over from the comics and the comics again is an amorphian addict and in the comics um draven well i should say the crow uh grabs several of the morphine bottles for his own use later on and like in like the later you know Sweet. in the in the later showdowns is like is shoots up straight you know shoots up in his neck oh. um before uh because we it is established both in in comic and in film that he can feel pain mm -hmm. um thus the cutting sequences in 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 both uh in both uh renditions Ooh, the okay going through the going so the, the, the scant details about it was there's the, the scene where they're filming the scene where where uh eric raven comes home and finds the other um you know fi walks in to find his fiance just you know being beaten and raped by um street by, thugs. by the street thugs like you do yeah <laughs> Uh, Fun Boy is the one with a, you know pulls the forty four, shoots him, but because of because of how they how the crew were prepping the prop weapons, not really prop weapons, you know this was a this was a straight forty four. They did um, going between shots of like close up shots of you know of a gun. Let's, let's do a quick let's do a quick little I'll quote here. A previous scene using the same gun had called for inert dummy cartridges fitted with bullets but with no powder or primer to be loaded in the revolver. For close-up scenes which utilize the revolver where the bullets are clearly visible from the front and do not require the gun to actually be fired, dummy cartridges were provide a more realistic appearance than blank rounds which have no bullet. Instead of, okay here we go, in terms of like cutting cutting corners and filming in uh, in North Carolina, Instead of purchasing commercial dummy cartridges, the film's prop crew, hampered by time constraints, created their own their own by pulling the bullets from live rounds, dumping the par powder charge, then reinserting the bullets. How however, they unknowingly left the live percussion primer in place at the rear of the cartridge. At some point during the filming, the revolver was apparently discharged with one of these improperly deactivated cartridges in the chamber, setting off the primer with enough force to drive the bullet partway down the barrel, where it became stuck, a condition known as squib load. The prop crew either failed to notice or failed to recognize the significance of this issue. So mm -hmm. when they're actually filming the sequence where, you know, he, actors are, are, you know, they're across the room from each other, you know, they, 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 sw you know, they, they so you have this, this damaged gun, which was not inspected properly. Mm -hmm. They give the, they loaded, they just, they load it up with, with blanks, give it to the guy and so they actually do it, yeah, and then uh, and actually film the scene. And critical detail from later in the, later in the wiki, as the production company had sent the firearm specialist home early, responsibility for the guns was given to a prop assistant who was not aware of the rule for checking off firearms before and after any handling. Therefore, the barrel was not checked for obstructions when it came time to load it with the blank rounds. Since the bullet from the dummy round was already trapped in the barrel, this caused the 44 Magnum bullet to be fired out of the barrel with virtually the same force as if the gun had been loaded with a live run, live round, and it struck Lee in the abdomen, mortally wounding him. He was rushed to the New Hanover Regional Medical Center in Wilmington, where he underwent six hours of surgery. However, attempts to save him were unsuccessful, and Lee was pronounced dead at 1.03 p.m. on the 31st of March, 1993, at the age of 28. <laughs> The shooting was ruled an accident. It's so sad. Yeah. I loved him. He's so great. And yeah, he lost a lot of weight. If you see him in the picture that he made, uh, that he shot before this movie, I mean, I should really stop using that word, before, that he filmed that <laughs> before doing this. Yeah, if you get yeah. rapid fire, rapid, is that rapid fire is excellent. Rapid fire, it's very good, and I really enjoyed it. Um, he's, well. yeah, he's a good 25, 30 pounds heavier, like he's softened, you know, like uh, his, he had the, he sort of still had a, um, um, what's often described as baby fat um, around the contours of his face that just made him look like such a good guy. He just, you know, was just such an adorable, like, you know, high school dreamboat. And then, you know, of course in The Crow they really stripped him right down so that, you know, make those cheekbones pop a little bit. 
you know, make the, you know, the, the muscle contours look a little bit groovier. Um, it's a very common thing. You have to sort of, you know, it's almost like being in a, you know, it's like being a wrestler. You have to make weight before you get on camera. And, uh, you know, some, you have to do kind of whatever it takes to really make your musculature, um, look right, um, on, like on camera specifically, um, people who are, um, sort of like, uh, like bodybuilders and whatnot, they may not, uh, if they're not going to be in before an audience, they don't really look that way. Um, there's a certain process that you go through to drop a lot of water weight mm -hmm. to sort of dehydrate the tissues and sort of dehydrate the skin. So it sort of like cleaves to the, the body a little bit better and it cleaves to the muscle, it cleaves to the musculature a little yeah. bit more to you make it like jump out. Much more, much more cut. Where, uh, yeah. Uh, this was, uh, this came to mind, um, watching, uh, Dr. Strange yesterday where, uh, um, Benedict Cumberbatch, you know, has his one shirtless scene in the movie and, uh, yeah, he's, he's, he's pretty built up on that. And I'm like, uh... I wonder. I wonder if they did that at the very beginning of filming or at the very end of the filming, because trying to maintain that kind of physique for an entire shoot is really—it's kind of unsafe. Um, and for him to just sort of be in his like, you know, like top physical condition with as much muscle on his body as possible, it may not actually look the way that they—it may not provide the pres the. Uh, the presentation that they're hoping for to you know give you that impression on screen um it, uh based on um chris evans having uh, to basically like do 100 push-ups before his uh first shirtless you know post ser uh, super serum scene in captain america the first avenger um in that you know he was as pumped as he possibly could be but they figured they could make him look even more pumped if he had been very freshly exercised immediately beforehand. So he's just doing push-ups before he has to go on camera. Whatever happened to the prosthetic Ricard Ricardo Montalban? <laughs> no, that's his real chest, dude. No, like he was buried. He was buried in it. Yeah, Ricardo Montalban <laughs> was built as hell. That's his actual chest. That's no prosthetic. That's how he's actually built. I... It looks amazing, but no, that's Is that it... true. I mean, there's, there's it's some pictures. True. It looks like. Yeah, it looks terrible. It looks know? like a prosthetic. Because I know. Because that's, I'm a tricky baby. Yeah, it's, I'll say it is one of the more um, infamous Highly contested. Yeah, infamous uh, bits of trivia about the about the film about uh, uh, that film's production. The, 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 the wrath of God. That, that that it's not a prosthetic. No, because he just really had that like really super built up chest just naturally. I mean, he had that kind of he had that chest when he was like in his twenties, and so in his. 60s I'm guessing he was in his 60s in Wrath of Khan maybe younger cuz I think he was younger cuz he looked like he was in his 60s in like the naked gun <laughs> That's yeah. probably true A full um, six or but seven years later. yeah I mean that, that's the reason that's part of the reason why his costume is that way so you can show his manly manly chest right and he is you know what was the, what was the um god what, I can't remember Kirk mockingly refers to him as something like Oh, I am laughing at the superior because he is the superior, the superior bearing, intellect. I am laughing at the superior intellect, the superior <laughs> bearing. But back to but God, back, 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 but back, well, but, but the, the weird thing about in um is at least in the crow the bot I think the body modification it's not just I mean it was it it certainly predated modern you know post. Uh, post P90X CrossFit mm -hmm. Hollywood, mm -hmm. but in this case, it wasn't so much. Um, you didn't know you, uh, you know, you, the the ideal body type was. Yeah, it's exposing it's, it, and it was it, it's very well defined musculature, mm -hmm. but it's it, but it's junky look. Yeah, it's the, it's, the, it's like the uh, like heroin like, chic. Yeah, heroin yeah, chic, very much exactly. So. Where and it's kind of a thing where yeah, that's where and a lot of the. There, yeah, there were far more, you know, because the marketers knew what they were doing, or at least thought they did. There are far more, there are promotional materials of him without his shirt on, like kind of just like you know he's in full makeup and and, and like you know white body, um, white, um, he's got white body paint all over his, you know, he's topless, mm -hmm. like you know, shots of him in 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 the uh, in his attic, that they 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 you you know was used as part of the for, uh, promote, you know, it's like. Going for those Peter Murphy, uh, Peter Murphy bucks. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of funny if, if like 
uh, Golden Era, <laughs> Golden Era Bauhaus. They actually they all went they all, they're they're all put through a, a, a training regimen, <laughs> and to see what kind of what what, ha, what would become of them later. You remember, <laughs> side note, d- around the corner, um, did you know that they're actually w- very briefly in the building that houses Future Dreams Comics mm-hmm. and a Jazzer Size location? <laughs> there actually there at one point was a place called Bauhaus CrossFit. <laughs> using using the logo, I, it's like you did not license that. <laughs> using the band's logo in the um, you know the, that icon in their logo. Health God, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> the, and, but that that icon was was uh, the pre predated the the band, didn't it? What did what didn't it come from something else? I don't know actually. I uh, I was uh, it was much more to Joy Division. I was never I think the only the only uh, the the only Bauhaus album I have was uh, is the live bootleg, which I played on That's Halloween. Great. You should really get into the magic of just their entire output and everything surrounding it. It's just it's so. It's so multifaceted, and and so much of it is very silly, and, mm. and um, just a lot of different like like the amount of experimentation with different musical styles that they did is something that is not really you know considered about them as a as a group these days, except for by their fans. And I mean, it's it's just such a good time. Yeah, I think I I own more I own more Love and Rockets albums than I do Bauhaus mm. albums. Yeah, that's and that and yeah. that's because there's more of them for one thing. Um, there's really not there's only a handful of, of actual Bauhaus yeah, albums. There's, there, well, the, the, there's originally four, and then they mm-hmm. came out with that. And then they go away yeah, white. and then there's Go Away White, which is okay. it was I you know it's I was. Okay. It's it okay. was nice that they they did that. It, it is, <laughs> but I don't. I, you know, I, I, I'm, I hope they made a bunch of money from it because uh, you know I I didn't buy it, and uh, I'm a humongous Bauhaus fan. Yeah. But I gave it a listen and was like, I don't know, this is not really working for me. I just, and just occurred to me another another great, we'll call it a transition or bridge point, mm. the going from um, from Bauhaus to the music of the film and and mm-hmm. and also the mm-hmm. soundtrack at the it was like both film and soundtrack right place right time right band mm-hmm. where because it was hitting i think the uh sean o'neill at the av club did an excellent excellent um uh just long piece on on each song of the soundtrack but also it hit the, you know because it was positioned perfectly where ntv was still marketing towards gen xers but it was kind of like it was the when you're getting all the all the follow-up the follow-up grunge bands the 120 minutes had been on for uh what how many years at that point and and Uh, had been joined in like 85 86 yes and had been joined by that point had been joined by alternative nation Mm -hmm. and it was really really good yeah i think i think the inclusion of the stone temple pilots on that um soundtrack was bad idea yeah that was and, that was uh well on the other hand you uh, know they were they were of their moment and well, they were yeah, they were a big thing at that time may, again may of 1994 that um even then i mean i thought like well this just doesn't fit at all <laughs> and then these things is not like the others and then, and then then they put it in the movie and they're like have a like, car chase or whatever and it's like time <laughs> to take <laughs> home <laughs> And, and it is still, and, <laughs> and it is still my, and it, and it is still my favorite, uh, for better or for worse, still my favorite Stone Temple Pilot song. Because yeah, cause, cause, uh, for uh, which, it's kind of good it's, actually. It's got the best yarl in. Like, yeah, it's hey, got, yeah. Really, Oh, I don't know. No, put, hungry no, um, or or push. Like they're oh, 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 with in him doing full on laundry. Yeah, when yeah him doing full on uh, him doing full on Eddie. You know, kind of their their breakout Eddie Vedder like uh, like singing. But the, the soundtrack, like I said, it was if you and if you were um, the, I graduated high school the month the film came out. So oh, I was wow. I remember uh, freshman year of uh, freshman year of university. It must have been like losing your virginity. It was. It was just. It's just one of the things you remember. <laughs> of uh, of that's. Of, we like I said. We saw that film three times that year. Once, mm-hmm. once opening night. Mm-hmm. Once uh, at a dry, at uh, at the Miracle Tw- Twin Drive-in on the east side of Flint, Michigan. Ooh. Paired with of all things, um, Beverly Hills Cop Three, <laughs> which which uh, which had a which had a uh, had a cameo by uh, by a pre-hated George Lucas and his then wife. Um, and then later, I, I think, that. 
and then later, uh, then later saw it on campus. I like George Lucas now. I still like him. Uh, I wish people would get off of his dick. I, I, He's yeah, fine. I, I like what he did. He uh, likes black people. Yeah, I like that he built the the, the affordable housing yeah. in the community where they wouldn't yeah. let him build a movie studio. Yeah. <laughs> did he? Actually, but did like, he, fuck you. We're gonna have poor people well, living here then. But, that's right. But did he actually yeah, follow through on that? Yeah. The and, but and did but did I think part of it it was, it was one of the criticisms was like well that's a great you know. That's commendable, but did he build up any infrastructure around there, or did he just like here we're gonna have this low-income housing unit in this neighborhood that, that does not have any infra any infrastructure? <laughs> yeah, that has that had that, that is the, uh, complete where everybody's completely priced out of you know it's, it's like being uh, being on low-income housing and all, being able to shop from nothing but Zupans. Yeah, you know, mm. I've been there. Well, but and but, but but yeah, but just being on the. Um, but that's sound much like the Pulp Fiction soundtrack. Those are the two. Uh, those two soundtracks, the Crow soundtrack and the Pulp Fiction soundtrack, were for me. You know, senior year high school and well, I think senior year high school and uh and also freshman shit freshman sophomore year of university, which was for me. You know, it was like freshman year started uh, fall of ninety four. Uh, Natural so like, Born Killer soundtrack also. Yeah, the guess, Trent Reznor assembled. Yeah, that was the in, Re, Rez, Trent Reznor covering. You know, appearing on the soundtracks, covering uh, covering a Joy Division song. Was, yeah. it, was, it, was it Shadow Play or was it was it was it uh, was, was it New Dawn Fall? Dead, Dead Souls. Dead Souls. Yes, that was it. And indeed, that's still pretty much my favorite uh, Trent Reznor yeah. slash Nine Inch Nails yeah. project. Like the, my favorite cover. track of his, uh, basically of all time. And you know, as shameful as it is, it that one song is what got me into Joy Division, like, actually, after, you know, kind of knowing a couple of their songs um, since I was, you know, thir 12 or 13, because I'd seen the video, and was like, oh, Joy Division, but, you know, I didn't really, you know, uh, um, Lovell Terrace Apart wasn't really one of the things that was really presented to us very much, and I'd never heard any of the, you know, records or compilations or anything, and that one particular track that uh, that Trent decided that he would cover, I was just like, God damn, that's a really, really good tune. I should really, what is this? What is Joy Division all about? I think I'm going to actually like pay attention to this. And then did, he's like, oh, I love this. <laughs> did you, or did, did either of you go go to the Wonder Ballroom to see uh, Peter Hook and the Light uh, cover? Not this year. No, apparently, I guess he does it every year, which I what? totally didn't know. Well, yeah, not, and, not, uh, if one of my coworkers was like, uh, yeah, it's now my yearly, my yearly cathartic uh, dance party. And um, I was like, he does it every year? She's like, he's, he, um, he's done it at least three times. I'm glad to hear that because I thought I missed my, I thought it was like a once in a you know, just... yeah no i guess he does it and he has a good time and it, and it sells out well so he he he, he, gets, he trades bass or at least on his first tour because this um he trades bass duties with his son because he can't play and sing so his son who's also uh, his son is there He's playing human. bass um <laughs> after all. and after we record remind me i'll show you the uh the first time they first time he came through on a solo the solo uh his solo band tour um Played just down the street at Doug Fur, and I got to meet him afterwards. He got a nice photo with him, and I just actually said to him, "Like, by the way, you're the reason why I switched from guitar to bass." Aww. I was like, yeah, that's what I like to hear. But Aww. the um, <laughs> the but in terms of cover, you know, covers are the jo yeah, Joy Division or band through which covers are the way um are the entry point yeah they're they're definitely the uh they're 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 the the training wheels for you know riding the actual bike. Right, that's you know Moby covered a, Moby covered a Joy Division song for the soundtrack of Heat uh, a couple years later after The Crow, mm. but for me uh, it was discover getting into um... New Order. No, um, God damn it! It was <laughs> the guys the guys who the guys who formed Luna. What did they do? What was the band before Luna? Galaxy Five Hundred. Yeah. Galaxy 500's oh. cover of Ceremony. Oh, yeah, that I was right that. place, yeah, right that time. Is so good, and hitting yeah. that, encountering that right in the air. When I was that getting made into, me a Galaxy 500 fan. That, <laughs> yeah, was, that was amazing. <laughs> Dude, discovered see, that, discovered that in summer of 2000, and just obsessively think that was that's got me into Joy Division. That was how I when I switched from playing guitar to playing bass. Mm -hmm. There's a really good. Uh, um, 
I think Radiohead cover of that also. That's such, such a great cover band. They're such a great cover band. If they if they just never if they never did more if they never did original stuff ever again and just did covers, I would I mean, still be completely satisfied. I mean, Ceremony was never recorded in the studio by Joy Division. I mean, it was just in the mm -hmm. demo, but I, or like a live, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, so I, the only like really polished version of it from that band is really New Order mm -hmm. and, yeah. and that was their first single I think yeah, yeah there's and there's like four or five versions of it the I could uh, and when uh, with my uh, my other um, who, the guy who was at one point music director of my college radio station WCBN FM Ann Arbor uh, uh, Carlos Sufran who is now living in San Francisco and still plays out as a DJ mm. I can remember when he was also the you know he was the guy who kind of, he hit me to a lot of a lot of the good stuff we were in, uh, thanks to CMJ 2001 being rescheduled, we wound up go. you know, I had the day, you know, I was, I had, I had been laid off and he had taken the days off. So I was like, well, screw it. Let's just go to Chicago instead. And I can remember thinking like, mm -hmm. oh, this was a single. I wonder if it, I wonder if I can find a copy of, uh, of Ceremony and the first, he was like, Hey, let's, let's, that's a good idea. Let's go find it. And the first record store we, we went into had a, had that, that new order single of Ceremony on a 45 nice. for like $5. Oh, like, wow. Well, like, well, oh, well, shit, that was easy. Kismet. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, and you bought that and that was that. It was meant to be. But it was like, said it but the soundtrack was one of those things where everybody you, loved it yeah that was the thing just like the the real like complete saturation kind of of a culture where just you know if everybody from nearly every walk of life was just playing it constantly and it wasn't yeah and it was oh sorry go ahead. oh just is it kind of, kind of like um, Depeche Mode when they came out with Violator. Yeah. It was awesome. like they're like a top 40 band. Yeah. Because, yeah, and suddenly everybody's just like, everyone oh, caught Depeche on. Mode, and I'm just like, really? Uh, I used to beat me up for liking that kind of music. It was, <laughs> I can remember listening to, listening to the top 40 radio station in Flint, Michigan, CK105, um, and yeah, uh, 1989, they played that, you know, Depeche Mode singles were in constant rotation. Violator is a fucking good album it's though. really good well uh, j that's the thing about Depeche Mode actually all their albums are really good they, they and they, they so uh, I mean I still like the the new stuff that's coming out like lately it's, mm -hmm. they, yeah it's totally it's completely legit they're and not one of those bands where it's like oh their old stuff was great and like like uh, the new stuff is kind of eh. mm -hmm. but I mean, sorry I, about I, I... <laughs> <laughs> sorry dudes well yeah but <laughs> But, uh, they're uh, all English post-punk bands. What are you gonna do? Yeah, yeah. You know, I just have to buy their. You know, their, they they just needed to they just needed to break up. I think that it's not good for um, Peter and Daniel and David to really try to write songs together. Like I think that you know, just kind of that anarchy that they that they had when they were like you know young and really 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 high yeah they right place just, right they time really right just yeah they really can't do that anymore and i mean partially just like they tried to to reestablish the friendship that they had and it totally didn't work and you could and like you can kind of see it and kind of feel it in the music of trying to make this connection again and it mm -hmm. doesn't and it doesn't happen and so it's just it's it's more it's it's more sad to listen to than anything else. But and then, but as a, to get back to an earlier point, a, a sad bit of news. But because of I think Paramount, the, the studio pretty much was full, was it, once Brandon Lee died with only like three or like three days left of principal photography. Mm -hmm. They were they're like no, it's just pitch it. We have no idea how to solve this thing, mm -hmm. and we're really we're, we're uh, about ready to just trash the entire enterprise. And I think pretty much did. Mm -hmm. And then Miramax came along and pumped some more money into it. Uh, helped, you know, they had to do, they had to rewrite some stuff. They cut like the, the scenes with the um, with the ghost cowboy were cut. A lot of you know the, the <laughs> which were which helped which helped <laughs> went. Uh, hey, Michael Newberry in a crow film with a bad mask would have been an, a much weirder thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like I said, find, I yeah, look at the, uh, like I said, if you ever want, uh, ever want to see a weird little kind of like, you know, cut bits from a film, the bits of The Crow where, I think, what is it, is it actually called Ghost Cowboy? So the movie was actually made better because Brandon Lee died and the things, the edits that they had to make. Mm-hmm. 
in, because of get you know getting around that. Yeah, right. that does happen that's sometimes. Interesting. Yeah, yeah that sometimes yeah. really, really, really bad news or something really like tragic or something awful happening over the course of a film's production, if that if it can then be salvaged and it needs like revision and stuff, it the then it you tend to end up with a really really good picture it's that like way. another case and sometimes of, not it's yeah. another case of like the shark doesn't work <laughs> yeah. art, art with what was it art are all all art all art has or all good art i see us being the, the one not really artist here <laughs> all um you're fronting dude yeah the uh, well my art comes from uh my 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 art artistic limitations are probably more from due to laziness and add than anything else mm -hmm. but it's like all good all great art comes with has limitations the and the most re was it the you you just want to interject you're you're playing a role though in 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 art by 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 having this podcast and by reacting to it and by having an opinion on it and by yeah you're boy, like the George it? Martin to you, our Beatles you are, right. you uh, you are one half of the equation <laughs> I mean, Beatles, you're, the, you're the Timbaland to yeah. our well, music then, with, it was without... the Beatles and the Stones you see that <laughs> have the Rolling Stones killed the but the uh, well, again you know it kind of uh, art through adversity even and even most recently the the you know onset accident with the latest with well not the latest i should say the, with these with star wars the force awakens yeah which caused them to completely like like you know delayed six months and they ch you know and from all all reports rewrote some stuff uh restructured the film mm -hmm. made it better from this yeah, where they're just like where they almost what? killed Harrison Ford on set. Yeah, mm -hmm. and they're just like, oh, what? And they're like basically like rewatching the rushes and stuff and going, mm -hmm. man, John and Daisy are fantastic. We right. should really just like open up their roles a little bit and let them have and give them some more scenes. Uh, okay, we're gonna have to revise the story a little bit. Mm, do, 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 do. Okay, now shoot this, and then they crushed it. And they're like, oh, we could we could do that more. Right. Hey, let's do that even more. So. Um, yeah, it just makes me wish that uh, uh, they felt the same about Carrie Fisher because uh, she was great and uh, they really should have let her, they should have given her uh, more lines. We got, well, we have two more films, let's see. Yeah, that's true. Just when she makes it through the third, uh, the third film. She's well, going to be she fine. Yeah. She's going to be fine. And the, don't um... say that. She's fine. She's immortal. She'll never die. I'll hire vampires to make it happen. The, but back to, again, um, Miramax had to take the film, kind of restructure it. They cut the, mm -hmm. it wasn't the ghost cowboy, it was the skull cowboy. Uh, go online, search that for... That sounds way cooler. Yeah, go for, search, the, and who, who only appears, like, I think in, like, like two pa two or three pages, or at least two or three scenes in the original, um, in the original comic series, mm -hmm. but helps, you know, helps delineate uh, the crow's powers and explains to him, you know, gives him his, you know, it, expository character only with a hat and no face mm -hmm. um his scene you know all of his scenes <laughs> played by the uh cult horror icon michael newberry should have been sam elliott <sighs> but it he was can't play every he cowboy can't, yeah, he can't play every supernatural cowboy at least this one was much more especially one with uh with you know wearing full-on mask and rotting uh, yeah that would be a waste of his face his voice though it's just his, his voice. voice is great it's true you could have it voice can sells me it can sell me cars but and um but like i said yeah they had to structure and they they saved the film and you know at, at some point they used some stunt doubles and i think i think i remember reading that at one point they had god what was it was it i thought of, i thought i read that like christian slater had to read even like dub them some dialogue but maybe it was another hmm. actor because hmm. uh, i've heard i've heard that credited to a couple different actors oh hmm. for, you know for brandon lee for brandon lee yeah because oh. like they had they, they didn't they they didn't film they they were they were not completely there's so much like body double work in the uh in the film like all, all the scenes of him on top of his uh on top of the roof you know just jamming mm -hmm. away at, at his at his metal in his you know hyper metal <laughs> Think about the going back to the music. The music is for you know visually the film is goth. Uh, musically the film it's not goth. It's kind of like goth. Uh, the, the goth. The, it's like goth it's industrial. It's death rock. It's industrial. Yeah, it's industrial and yeah, the industrial little yeah the way more sort of like um, noisy. But it's like clear thrill guitar, cult, cult. More, yeah, kind of thrill, the more the other the, the, the ninety, you know, kind of grunge era marketable mm -hmm. uh, industrial I entrance. It it lacked KMFDM. 
It did lack, well, yes, and or Knights of Reb. Um, that would have also worked out pretty good, but, well, you know. I, I was kind of curious, I'm, and I, I didn't think of looking this up until now, like what kind of career boost happened to both uh, with my life with the Thrill Kill cult and as well as Medicine as being mm -hmm. the two bands who were shown performing their songs like on screen. And even like the, uh, the Thrill Kill cult having the memorable... <laughs> For like the second nightclub scene, it's like the one where they're still playing through in this where you know where you know in this fa in this empty factory where there's just a guy hired to be behind the stage with a grinder. Just you know, it's, they're in a factory that produced you know that '80s uh, that '80s movie or heavy metal or music video factory that just produces sparks. You watch them again. There's and there's the answers an annoying button building. Yeah, there's just a guy behind us. But you know, at night, this is like a Friday night. He's that you know, you, yeah, you know, a he's union just, machinist. He's just, he's just grind. He's just you know machining he's some like tools. The early you know? early days of the do for you. Yeah, he, yeah. He's just yeah. grinding. He's behind the stage, just grinding and just mm -hmm. shooting sparks everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, it's all in answers under you. But it's just, a, just something about that stupid scene where, um, like, they're still they're still playing, even though there's this massive, massive gunfight mm -hmm. where not one but multiple multiple shot up, you know, multiple air hold um, bad guys plummet through windows down onto. The, it's not until mm -hmm. like the second, I think it was the second body that falls, yeah, exactly, that they actually like react like, or oh, they wow. stop playing. But you know, that's like what Thrill Hill Cult shows are just like. You know, every time, like yeah. somebody gets killed and like you know, crashes bloodily onto the stage, every time. So of course they were just like, oh yeah, you know, it's you'd, Tuesday. You'd think they'd ramp up security by now. Nah, like, that's my, not the thrill kill call. My, my parents wouldn't want to let me go to one of those shows <laughs> if that was the case. No, exactly. Like, that's why the kids love it. <laughs> I got it's danger. I got blocked from going to from uh, going downtown to see Guar on one of the one of the, one of the oh. on their early nineties. Uh, Devil's Night performances at the Capitol Theater, mm. um, and you know that's that's what I was growing up in the uh, growing up in the suburbs. Like, and and that's why you're a serial killer now. Uh, not publicly. Okay. But, oh, she, she dumb. Yeah. Sorry. But, but yeah, but John, you brought the point of like I think one of the, what, you, what you saw is one of the failings of the film, and I guess the, the comic too was that his um, I guess both his powers aren't really delineated all that well. Or in 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 the uh, as well as like having a foil. Well, well, well. To me, I I mean, I thought that that wasn't necessarily like a failing of the comic because the comic just wasn't telling that kind of a story. The comic wasn't telling a Manichaean style um, <clears throat> good versus evil. Here are the rules. Watch them play it out, and the good guy wins at the last minute. Yeah, it, it was playing. It, it was just a straight up revenge tale. For you know, people who were the right age group, who had all this angst and turmoil in their own lives, you know, they wanted to see the the fucking like. Uh, well, I guess in the in the comic, it was like the very uh, uh, ethnically uh, diverse uh, bad guys, you know, <laughs> who say things like, "Yo, fool, you smoke all my rock." <laughs> Yeah, um, uh, James O'Barr, <laughs> James O'Barr, the original comic creator who does appear, you know, is does have a cameo in the uh, in the film, as doesn't uh, um, is the uh, what, what's what's the timestamp at uh, the uh, of the cameo? It's forty odd minutes in. It's the scene where the scene where it's right after you failed, Jeremy. You uh, failed. Yeah, uh, whatever. After right after Gideon, Gideon's pawn shop is blown up, and and Ernie Hudson's character is confronting um, the crow, mm -hmm. and he looks over and he sees a bunch of people. <laughs> because you know this kind of fantasy Detroit is that bad. You see a bunch of like street hooligans uh, looting a, a a store that is still, it's still on, on fire. fire. <laughs> still, you know, it has exploded thirty seconds ago, no, and they show up immediately. And it's yeah, one of you they're can, ready. <laughs> you see a guy carrying a TV with long, you know, balding but with long hair. That is the creator James O'Barr. The other interesting cam there's a, there's a film full of in, of um, interesting characters, but I I, I I like the fact that there's the first time we go to the the villains headquarters um, club, you see a uh, you see a ba that band promo shot of uh, of what is it Hangman's joke of the Crows band of Eric Draven's band. Mm -hmm. Right next to that is a is a uh, black and white promo shot of Big Chief, who were an actual early '90s Detroit. Um, like rock and roll band, which is a nice little thing that I, I a nice touch that I always dug. 
It's like seeing a Dark Horse comic in yeah. the comic shop of basically any TV show, which is pretty much the only comics you will see on any TV show. You'll notice that almost all of them are Dark Horse titles. I don't know how that's worked out, but it's worked out pretty well. I just wanted to follow up about um, oh, okay. the uh, the exposition about the, the powers and also the, the lack of having um, a foil uh to, it's like the you know, uh classic story structure is basically you know there has to be some sort of conflict and and uh a way to get beyond that conflict and the story kind of just uh explains how and and the conflict in the comic it wasn't about the conflict with the bad guys it was like an in, inner turmoil of how does the crow find peace? How does you know? How, how does he get rid of his his own personal demons and make everything right? The way you know Sarah says at the beginning of the movie, uh, crow comes back to, to make things right. And it, the, the I didn't mind the lack of exposition on the on the how the powers work or mm, okay. where the the mythology draws from that that it comes from because I know it's you know suspend my disbelief. It's a comic and enjoy it as a as a fable and what what the story's about what i charge the movie with is they Shuck-use. they try to give you that exposition and explain away what his powers are and how to take them away to kind of at like you know with like 10 yards to go <laughs> they're like a the 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 Big bad guy, the boss of Mike, all the other top top dollar, paid the, by Michael Wincott. Top dollar, the Canadian top. with a southern accent, set in Detroit somehow. The 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 I accept it. The the white, long haired, well dressed, uh, international male. Yes. Yeah, international. So so he, so he him and 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 his Asian, big, boobed like the, the B- Biling, Yeah, his Biling, his mall, the, his Miss Biling. Setting up, setting up a trope for the for every other film. He likes to cut up, cut yeah. cut up people's eyes for yeah. her, like, you know, but they great. they figure out like at the very end that okay, wait a minute, he's invincible except if we kill the bird, and they kind of work out the mechanics of how, and and they just kind of interject this very contrived way they can they, they can set up uh stakes they, yeah, yeah so that there's stakes. some so, kind of stakes so it's not so that, just like this clearly immortal you know wronged bad or good guy and going to, after these guys there has to be some way to take him down otherwise there's no tension right well yeah and, and in the book there's are just that's their justification in I guess. the in the book there was tension because the crow was so kind of he had such such a maniacal dark side that mm-hmm. it was it was all feeling what he was going through that dark side and that maniacal thing like getting back to it i think i still think the mental health stuff was whitewashed for the movie just like the ethnicities of the bad guys were whitewashed for the movie <laughs> uh, because otherwise it would look really bad. <laughs> it would look really bad. I mean, even it, yeah, even it looks kind of bad. Yeah, it looks yeah. Even the, the original comics, how it looks really bad. It, yeah, it James O'Barr. I don't think it took it took James, it took James O'Barr a while to to realize to how to to learn how to like non insultingly render black people because like, mm-hmm. there's some uh, in the in the first couple of issues that like, there's yeah. some of the stuff that's really bad. <laughs> it's pretty bad. Yeah, well, <laughs> and, like, they're, they're just sitting there eating their watermelon, mm-hmm. and all of a sudden this. Yeah. You know, gothic white knight in shining armor comes to mm, Peter Murphy comes to man. you know meet yeah. out justice and uh, you know what? As a black person, I can tell you that doesn't happen. Peter Murphy doesn't show up to you know meet out justice to even black people who do bad things. Right? He just uh, he doesn't show up. But um, yeah, so so I guess like making the movie so that, that like less racist that's a good thing, but making making the movie whitewashed in the way that um that the you know the taking away the the less savory less palatable traits of the hero to make him more uh i guess more relatable relatable both the kind of thing you could put a poster up in your bedroom and like your mom's not gonna freak out uh did 
that like I, I sort of I sort of like, this is kind of contrived BS and it's it's sort of contrived in a way that like they're setting up a new morality for comic book movies and that like it's okay mm-hmm. it's it's now okay you can still be heroic and be fixated about obsessive violent revenge mm-hmm. and like that's a that's now something to be celebrated and not just extermination but like painful extermination yeah, like, like, which... like sadism is now yeah is now cool yeah. it is is now isn't it is now is now okay if... and, they, and, they, and i feel like that's really kind of been run with a little bit and uh, when it's done well there's one way there there's one that that's that's one approach but it can be done badly so so much more easily i guess so i thought i think when frank miller did it you know he did it kind of with batman and it's like wow this is incredible because he's doing it with a character that we all know and he's kind of like probing the the inner psyche of him and it's like a very interesting spin on the relationship with the joker and uh, you want to say something oh no i'm just saying that but i Two things about a whitewashing um, the really like I said they uh, Brandon Lee ended up ha- uh, you know scoffing at I think one of the orig- earlier versions of the script which had like this this uh, evil um, evil mystical Asian character I think who got kind of rewritten into being the the bad guy's mole um, but also I think the film itself is actually far less far less sadist than 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 the uh, than the comic the book, series, yeah, uh, absolutely. And and because we are running out of time, I want to at least wrap. Uh, nothing else, just start wrapping things up. Of because I got to go pick up uh, my friend Miranda, and we got to go see a movie in thirty minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess what I'm saying is the comic books, like let sadism, you know, uh, shine through as being something like scary and dangerous. Mm-hmm. In the movie, they kind of sold it to you as as like. You know, this yeah, is cool. This, this is kind of well, cool. Yeah, this and is, it's is... And yeah with the they sanded off the edges of both the act, the axe and the character, <laughs> if you will. Well, the, the axe he does, not just the axe, because I, I don't think he wields an actual axe, <laughs> which would have made it, which would have made an interesting. You know, how do you fight? How do you, uh, you know, how do you fight? Yeah, but they really did. They uh, they an angry immortal guy with an axe. Yeah, <laughs> makes it harder. I think. I think not. The, for the audiences that didn't read the comic, which is probably the majority, ninety-nine point nine, the vast, yeah. vast majority, yeah, so they didn't notice that they just kind of taped on this really cheap plot device at the very end of the story just to make for a good, a good, you know, conclusion sequence. And to me, it was like, eh, I, I, it seemed like it was kind of a hybrid sort of, yeah. Uh, go, type of movie what what it was trying to accomplish but all in all i guess i think part of it's it's one of those things where i think it was a film where it it is very much one of those films like (laughs) like the lost boys where the the age at which you see it uh and it's if you see it young enough or at a certain part time of life or part um imprints you know it will imprint on you to where it becomes like this um because yeah, you know, same thing with any with with any like with any uh, uh, like film or whatever you, that you enjoy, it imprints on you from a certain age, like an, almost like a, un- a much more uncritical age. That you just it's just it's just it's it's a, something you have like warm feelings, and it's always kind of like you know the, its flaws being what they are and kind of overlooked. Yeah, I'm, so I'm so like I said, I still, no, it, it, no, it, it, yeah. Looking back on it, you know, I still enjoyed. It. It's kind of it's still the uh, it's still definitely you know worthwhile the just for both brandon lee and ernie hudson um and it just like i said it's a very different uh a a time capsule very much of what you know <laughs> of uh, a, a pop cultural time capsule from before uh, before modern times i guess it, it kind of begs the question um what would superman do with unlimited power and, and uh you know the ability to to stand up against any enemy like what would he do if lois lane was gang raped and i mean that kind of question has not been why asked. hasn't frank miller written that right? but, <laughs> but, 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 they, that, that's because... kind of like what the crow is and it's like a lot of people who've experienced that kind of trauma or are close to it in real life and know people who have been victimized like that they kind of they, they sort of needed you know I, it's yeah. like but well, i think but that's that story has been told and it's called it's called injustice 
the it's it, it's, it's part of the backstory between the uh, the the DC superheroes fighting game from like, this alternate world where uh, Lois, Lois Lane is killed and well, you know she's pregnant and is killed by the Joker and Superman snaps and just completely goes Alan Moore Miracle Man uh, and but more to the more sort of taking over the taking over the world um, and then you have some like Earth Two alternate universe stuff that kicks in. Well, the, I mean, the Crow uh, movie was just the high-profile version of that yeah. for, for, for the masses. Or like, uh, for people who can't read comic books. It's so. like, oh, all of a sudden, like, shit got real for, <laughs> you know, <laughs> some aspects of, like, what kind of uh, traumas and crimes we're avenging here. It's not just, like, mm -hmm. muggings. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I guess... Um, Give me a fi uh, final, any final thoughts from you? Um, I think that The Crow is definitely, uh, for a lot of us, um, especially uh, people my age, um, maybe younger, maybe older, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I can't really speak for them. I can only speak for myself. Um, How old it are was, you? Uh, I'm 44. Um, so I had just, uh or i was just about to graduate from college i guess when it came out um so uh and you know i had kind of been a goth for a while at that point so watching the movie was was both um something that i was i was able to recognize every single trope that was used in the film that uh i remember that you know if i can quote myself from that time walking out of the theater Having seen it with a bunch of my friends, I turned to them and said, this is like the first like major Hollywood, you know, this is the first goth Hollywood major blockbuster. And I think that things, you know, like we're going to, this is going to be, it's going to be really interesting to see like what kind of effect that this has. And I think that it did, it was really instrumental in sort of bringing these elements of what had been a more underground culture to the foreground and you know it, I don't I don't blame the crow for hot topic <laughs> but I know that the two kind of go hand in hand and that really there's there's kind there's nothing wrong with that really I think um, I but at the same time it also kind of implies that um, that kind of viewpoint and that kind of you know the wearing black clothes lifestyle and you know jet black hair and piercings and you know and katanas, and, katanas <laughs> and stuffed animals and you know roses and you know crows and stuff is something that's a provenance of the young that it's something that only young people actually really care about the younger and the younger the better and i mean i know some kids who were like in first grade who were pretty goth and i mean i can't imagine having grown up with some with that kind of culture available to me as opposed to something that I kind of shamefully had to like seek out and explore and instead no you just go to the mall and there's that one store that yeah. has that stuff and so I'm kind of jealous of them but at the same time I'm also kind of glad that you know I had to go through and get the stuff myself so um, I like I like the film a great deal. Um, it doesn't quite hold up. Uh, it's a little dated, but Brandon Lee is always just he's fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, his his star power is undeniable to this day. And more than anything, watching The Crow makes you incredibly sad that his life was cut short at such a it's such an incredibly young age. Right mm -hmm. when he was about to, you know, just before he was going to become an international superstar. But would he have become an international superstar had he not died? Maybe not, because, you know, his death did affect the film itself. So it's one of those paradoxes that we get to live with. Uh, John, any final thoughts? I remember um, I worked in a movie theater, I think, when I first saw The Crow, and I had other friends who did also, who were also kind of, who were maybe more entrenched in the, the goth lifestyle than, than I was. I was kind of on the periphery. But, um... I argued with like my female friends about it because they thought Brandon Lee was the the sexiest shit and that, that they loved the crow and and everything. But I don't know. And I, I would be watching it and I'm like, uh, the scene where Brandon Lee or where, where the crow comes in is like, I just want him and he <laughs> and they're they're using skank as as bait 
and he's just sniveling. He's like this guy. He's got like an eye. Poor skank. He's yeah. got. He obviously has like an eye. Skank scared, man. He <laughs> skank over there. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, could, I could be like a, a little on a big, a worm like on a big fat fucking hook. <laughs> that was that was amazing. Thank you. And, you, just, you, got to, you just have to clench your jaw. Where you, you can't have it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, and uh, you know that that whole scene. And and when he finally does kill Skank, it's like he's basically just this this guy who's got like an IQ of sixty, mm-hmm. who's like. I don't know how I got caught up with these guys. I don't know why. I, I'm just please. I'm begging for my life here, and I'm going to kill you anyway. Yeah. And he just, just, and he murders him. And I'm like, how can you feel good about that? And my friend <laughs> Sasha is like, well, you know, he gang raped his girlfriend with all the other guys. He raped her. And I said, well, yeah, they used a plot device so that we know early on. He is really he does bad. To die. So whatever yeah. happens to him, it's just but like showing the hero of a movie just exacting revenge, so cold blooded like that on somebody who's begging for their life. I it's kind wasn't, of harsh. I yeah. wasn't ready to embrace that. I was like, that's still, I you know, even though he, uh, like like you know the the the. The, the morality of comics and the, the the moral compass I grew up with was sort of like the the lessons that they give you after He Man. It's like no matter <laughs> how bad anybody is, it's like you know you don't take a life. And He Man thought he killed somebody in one episode. The Skeletor tricked him. He was so morose. He renounced all his powers. He's like, I killed a human being. I can't believe or or citizen and, of Eternia and found out about Christmas too. And, <laughs> and it's just like wow. It's it's like. Good guys don't kill people just because they have the power to do so. Um, so I, I I was really conflicted about it. I love the aesthetics. I love the music. I thought Brandon Lee was charismatic as all hell. I love Ernie Hudson. Yeah. I love, you know, I I just, uh, it, it's, it just didn't sit right with me. It's, it seemed like a new... Uh, a new morality of what is right and wrong was trying to be shoved down my throat by people trying to market this goth culture that they discovered the kids are into and they're like let's give this culture th- this is what this is what the the this is the Rosetta Stone of what it's all about and what are you know what what the uh, what what the philosophy of being goth is? It's like you know mm-hmm. you you but mixed with vigilantism. You hurt you hurt yeah, you, you hurt me. I don't know. It's, it's yeah. like this very there's there's a lot of Charles Bronson in it. Yeah. There's and a lot of you know uh, Dirty Harry. It's, uh, very, it's very libertarian. You know, yeah, kind, it's, kind and like, it is very libertarian. Or, just like and, you know, I'm above the law. And I, yeah, well, and also, I've always and uh, also reactionary. Yeah, yeah completely reactionary. It, it was very I spoke to a very conservative period for. I mean, Bill Clinton was president, yes, but he had that very tough on crime stance, and uh, uh, which is like I said, gets us into a whole other a whole other episode. The the the, 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 the rise of the the, the right wing uh, radio media of of uh, mm-hmm. the Rush Limbaugh uh, talking right. heads and, and all that stuff. We, we were definitely in in a new phase that the crow definitely like fit into as far as uh, the. Uh, what what an audience was able to accept and you know yeah. and enjoy life in the like the beginning life. of grim dark yeah the beginning of, and we have to leave it there uh i want to thank my guests for her showing up tonight real quick uh john how can folks reach you on the internet if they if you want them to um they can reach me uh my my website which hasn't been uh updated <laughs> but whatever john asher.com j o n a s c h e r i'm on facebook as well, that's right now. It's Jonathan Bad Ombre Asher. But He's a was, bad ombre it's because of the uh, yeah. I got you. It, it, ombre and ombre. It, 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 I don't know. It's yeah. like date, it, all podcasts are dated. All recordings are dated, and <laughs> we uh, we we are you know culture happens in the time it happens in. So yeah. Instagram John Asher artwork with artwork spelled with a. A R T W E R K. Vic, you, no, you're not going to remember any Vic. of this. Doesn't matter. Well, that's that's why go, that's why it goes on. That's why just, I, mean, I, I go. It go. It, this is all going on to a record. And I'll put it in the show notes. Ask, there you go. Ask Jeremy how to get in touch with me. There you go. Ask, um, ask Jamia. Uh, Jamia.com, J E M I A H. 
that's my website. Um, variations on my name are available on Twitter and Facebook, but just go to my website. And we uh, just and uh, once again, the uh, like, subscribe, review uh, for the tens of you who are, who will hear this. Uh, you can. F- Get, if you have any questions for me or you want to get a hold of the show, it's giving the mic on Twitter, all one word, giving the mic at gmail.com. And we now finally have a Facebook page just called um, it's facebook.com slash giving the mic, uh, all one word, yada yada. All right, on behalf of John and Jamil, I want to thank them again for our, again our time on this a rather prolonged. <laughs> Couple Man, prolonged recording are, sessions. This has been thorough, baby. Yeah, yeah. you haven't edited it yet. Yeah, so and, sure there's a lot of this stuff. <laughs> we'll see what. I, yeah, we'll see how long this is going to take me to cut down. But I want to thank everybody. <laughs> you could have, get a lot of episodes out of this, right? Yeah. And we'll and we'll do what we can. But thanks, thanks for tuning, thanks for uh, tuning in and listening to us uh, discuss topics that could probably go we go on another eight hours about. But anyway, <laughs> good night, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. talking a little about like the native american uh i guess mythos that inspired the the powers of the crow and if you want to sure well i mean because because uh, like actually the um the just the, the nuts and bolts of what are what are his powers how do they work how did he get them i mean they, they there isn't really that much exposition in the movie but there's a lot of kind of hey, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mythical thing people used to believe this it's actually true it only happens once in a while Go with it. Yeah, I think the um, the um, delineation of powers is a bit that they don't really uh, they don't get it. I don't know if how much they get into all that much either in comic or in or in movie. It's like yeah, he doesn't have a tr- um, the one the one scene where he would have had where they had a character played by Michael Bar- was it Michael Barron um, as like the uh, as the ghost cowboy um, you know which was cut i think in the only evidence that he's in there is you can just see there, there's just a shot yeah, I remember we were something yeah we watched the shot that. and um actually explained some things but eventually they figured you know they they change you know they cut the stuff they didn't they didn't like it they cut it out they put you know he all his dialogue was moved to other characters and they just thought he was extraneous and so he got but cut they they add, they added exposition about the powers um near the end and this is this is their only attempt to actually give Brandon Lee a foil in the movie it's like the, the the black henchman says to the the, the long haired uh, yeah, crime king friend. He's like top dollar, dis- Michael Wincott. Yeah, yeah okay. So it's a, uh, so kill the bird, destroy the man, and, and you know, and then they 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 figure it out that oh, that bird's always there. If we get the bird, he will have no powers anymore. I, now all of a sudden he is. It's like, oh, maybe maybe the crow's actually gonna be in power peril for a second. Yeah, before he vanquishes the bad guy. Well, there, there's that, but it's also the I think Bai Ling, Bai Ling's character is the one where is the the <laughs> mystical one. It's like you know he has power, but it is power you can take. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That, well, I think she was kind of that's the broad stroke she's getting at. What what and set up, actually set up it became a trope for every other film that the 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 um, the villain always has. A psychotic, mystical, spiritual, um, you know, his mall is always like the, is always the one that he's into, like the, uh, in like the, the mystical aspects of it. Yeah. If she, he, he and that it happens to be into this stuff. Yeah. Then, and, and go, it starts with Bai Ling in the first one and goes until Tara Reed in the last one. <laughs> yeah. The last, the last Crow movie is a piece of work, is, uh, it's, um, it's something. But the, the last one is uh, Edward Furlong. Is that, yes, yeah, the okay. one that I can say where Edward so, Furlong looks like um, looks like Feruza Bach. <laughs> so that that that's always kind of just why it was never as com- that compelling of a, of a story to me, is just because he didn't have a foil. And I think part, a lot of it was just like the pure uh, just the emotionalism of it all, and just the uh, the. Uh, also, there's also a uh, if you want there is a there's an armrest guard right by you mm-hmm. if you can eat it because the cat has uh, has mm-hmm. eaten the uh, she sure has has mm-hmm. done some work on that yeah but yeah, yeah right down there actually right to your right but I mean he he, he, has he didn't have he didn't have a foil in the comics so there it was just telling a very different kind of story than the Manichaean good versus evil that we're used to seeing uh, it was but in the movie they kind of had to Hollywoodize it you know and and 
give them a foil. Well, yeah, they end up. They, they have to. You know, they have to push that in there a little bit. They had, yeah, because it's kind of the thing. One of the things they bring up is the uh, the lack of delineation of powers. All right, um, mm -hmm. if you get your headphones, like, right, we'll yeah, start we'll... back up again. All right.